So thank you so much. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, uh, Mizuko Ito, or I guess Mimi, uh, join us. Uh, quick introduction. She is a noted cultural anthropologist with a strong focus on young people's use of media technology, uh, where she's explored ways in which digital media is changing relationships, identities, and communities, uh, having written many prominent books on this topic. She's a professor in residence at the Research Institute at the University of California, Irvine, uh, and she has an impressive academic uh, career. She did her undergraduate work at Harvard, then went on to go to Stanford, first to get a master's in anthropology, then to get not just one, but two PhDs. Uh, one for the, uh, her thesis was on interactive media for play, kids, computer games, and production of every life. And afterwards, because I guess, you know, she was just bored of this one, decided to do another one, and took another PhD uh, in the Department of Anthropology for her dissertation on engineering play, children's software, and the production of everyday life. So i um, very honored to have her join us because uh, I think she could give us some very valuable insights in this sort of digital world, uh, as particularly as it relates to our children's playtime online and all the benefits to that. So let's get started. Um, please, uh, uh, Mimi, if you could just quickly give us um, uh, introduction to yourself and um, your, your area of interest. So why, why were you so focused on particularly this intersection of youth yeah, and technology? Thanks so much for the kind introduction. So yeah, I'm an anthropologist by training, but I'm also a learning scientist. And uh, I've been a bit of a, I've made a bit of an unusual career for an educational researcher because mostly I study what kids do out of school and with digital technologies, what they choose to do for fun and what the implications are for their learning and development. Um, as you probably can guess, most educational research is focused on schools, but I've always been curious about uh, learning that happens when young people are genuinely engaged and interested and playing with their friends and they're learning without even knowing that they're learning. So a lot of the um, kinds of things I've studied, I hang out with kids on the internet and play video games with them and um, look at how they engage in popular culture like fandom around anime or you know popular games. And uh, what I've found in my work over the years is that uh, even though adults don't always recognize what young people are doing online as something that's valuable for their social lives, their development, their emotional health, and their learning. Um, in fact, kids are getting a lot of positive benefits that often go unrecognized by the grown-up That's world. great. So maybe um, to go to the sort of first question I have for you is, how does, um, you know, the, you work on the changing relationships with, so the youth have with media. Uh, and I think, um, you know, we'll talk later a little bit about sort of the, the, maybe the disconnect, the generational disconnect between parents mm -hmm. and children. But how has this relationship with media changed over the time that you have initially studied it to where it is today? Oh, yeah. Well, I have been studying this stuff since the olden days when uh, kids were just starting to learn how to um, use uh, technologies like text messaging, uh, when mobile phones were just beginning. Uh, very early internet days, which was all text based. And I think even if you look from the period, say, maybe 15 internet and social media adoption, um, if you, you know, but in the US, it was things like MySpace that, that were popular, uh, you know, um, in the um, in the East, in Japan, it was, you know, the early mobile internet. Uh, but during this time, um, you know, most of what, there, there was a small group of young people who were going online and meeting uh, people who they didn't know in real life online. Uh, but by far the vast majority of young people's social connection was really just to stay connected with their friends who they probably didn't um, get to see much outside of school, but all of these technologies enabled them to reinforce their real life social connections. I think what's really changed over the past maybe five, 10 years or so is that the um, majority, at least in the US as of about 2014, 15, of young people will say that they actually um, make new friendships online. And the online world is in many ways becoming not a replacement for the real world, but really a place to explore new kinds of relationships. A lot of it centers around things like gaming for boys, for girls, it's around social media, 
often around popular culture interests. And when I first started doing this research, young people thought it was a little bit creepy, a little bit weird to make friends um, just uh, for online relationships. But you know, really in the past five to 10 years, that relationship has shifted a lot. And the majority of young people will say that you know, of course their real life friends are important, but they also like to make friends online. It was an interesting uh, study, I think, by, by the Pew Research Institute just a few years ago where they were surveying the uh, sort of how many, I mean, this is not necessarily just related to youth, but how many people actually started a like relationship, not just friendship, but actually <laughs> right. a dating relationship uh, yeah. online. And the study came back and it said 40% of them. Yeah. That was just a few years ago, which, yeah, I remember when, when I first went online back in the days of CompuServe and, and Genie, the idea of meeting up was definitely sort of the domain of the strange and geeky yeah. people who just, uh, and today I guess it, you could yeah. say it's mainstream. Yeah, right? um, yeah. so um, I guess, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, COVID, right? Um, has COVID changed some of this or has it simply accelerated some of the trends? Um, you know, one of the interesting stories on COVID is most recently actually Part of their family of schools like University of Cal uh, California in Berkeley, they did your graduation in, uh, over mm -hmm. Minecraft, which I thought was, was pretty fascinating. Right. Um, is, this, is this the new normal? Um, are we going to be seeing online graduations uh, on Minecraft or are there some things that won't ever change um, or is it just an acceleration of what is already the inevitable? Well, I think it's probably both. Uh, you know, it has definitely accelerated certain trends that were already happening, like socializing through social media and video games, telework, um, online learning. All of these things were things that existed prior to COVID. Uh, I have a nonprofit that does online learning. Um, we run summer camps uh, through games like Minecraft and. We've been doing this for you know almost six years now. You know, just running purely online summer camps uh, in games like Minecraft and Roblox. But uh, you know, this year uh, in the COVID window, we've um, you know we've tripled our staff. You know, our programs have really got, gone through the roof. Uh, the programs themselves are the same, but the scale of um, the, num the numbers of people who are for homeschooling and experimenting with digital learn not just digital learning, but digital social learning, which was a very small niche pri prior to COVID, mostly uh, dominated by homeschool families, has suddenly become mainstream. So it's an acceleration uh, of a lot of those trends. Uh, but I think the thing we don't quite know yet is how different people's perception of these activities will be after COVID goes away. And that is the question, like I'm in the US now where we're still in the first wave and you all have been re reopening for a while. Um, I think the big question that we all have, those of us who do work on digital learning is, you know, how many people will stay using those kinds of um, services after their kids have the opportunity to play in the park and go back to school. I'm not sure we know that, but I think it's clear that some things are really different because it's like seeing a new world, like stepping through the looking glass in a world that grownups haven't always had visibility into. And then also teachers have visibility into what's happening in children's homes that they never had because they the home was not a environment that was within their thinking. They didn't know what their kids' lives at home were or how to connect with homes and families. And so there's definitely going to be, I think, a change in awareness, consciousness, openness, acceptance of certain kinds of digital connections now that um, in, in some ways the genie is out of the bottle and people have experienced um, both some of the challenges, but also some of the um, positive potential of connecting digitally across time and space with others. So I want to talk a little bit about these positive connections, but before a quick housekeeping uh, for the audience, uh, mm -hmm. there is a button here where you can ask questions. Uh, so, you know, I will periodically take a look at any questions you have. And to the extent that um, it's appropriate, I will them into our conversation and, and ask the question uh, so just just to let the audience know, but let's talk about the positives uh, because obviously you know we want to see what all benefits there could be. What what are some of the big positives um, that you know you you see for children sort of spending time online? And then now that it's COVID and people are in lockdown, um, is it too much of a positive to the point that people <laughs> need a break? 
like you know a popular thing is like screen time right do you you see is it too much is it okay you know what what is a parent to do um and and, and what is an educator to do um in this sort of new environment yeah uh, i think one of the positives again like um because computers and screens now they mediate so many parts of our social life you can't really talk about them screen activities separate from what it is that kids are doing, right? Because you can literally just watch YouTube videos or you can be building, you know, a calculator in Minecraft or you can be connecting to friends or grandparents. And so the nature of the engagement, it varies so widely that, you know, in our work at least, we've been really pushing against just this idea that screen time is one thing and to be really focused on the different kinds of activities that can be mediated by screens. Um, and so if we look at it this way, I think one of the types of things that young people have been doing through mobile phones and digital connection is supporting each other online and having um, sort of socially and emotionally supportive relationships. And I think that's one thing that COVID really changed parent awareness about because you know, in a world where you can't just go to the park or go to school and see your friends, parents realize that social connection is really important. And for, you know, the, the vast majority of at least boys, gaming is kind of the environment where they hang out with their friends. And, you know, recent surveys have been coming out during the COVID window that have shown pretty definitively that these gaming environments, at least young people perceive them as sort of a lifeline to friendships and social support. Um, similar for, you know, different kinds of social media. Some of the research has been really clear that especially for young people who are socially disconnected or isolated or marginalized in some way, connection through digital means is like, you know, it is almost essential to their social and emotional well being um, when they don't have other ways of connecting with their friends. Um, so that's one. And, you know, as a parent, it's kind of intuitive if you think of, say, um, you know, one of my colleagues, Candace Odgers, has um, done some research about young people who go off to college for the, same, for the first time. And often that's a very challenging transition for teenagers. But teenagers who have the ability to text message with their parents when, you know, something upsets them or when they need some support are much more emotionally resilient than kids who don't have that kind of connection. So just like text message can be a way of connecting with your own child, it's the same thing for kids and their friends. It's really where they get um, a vast majority of their social support these days. And then the other dimension is really just around learning. Um, you know, I think we're in an era now where everybody kind of recognized that YouTube is an amazing learning platform. Um, you can find how-to videos for just about anything. So even, you know, of course there are, you know, MOOCs and other digital learning platforms, but even just the ability to Google, to go onto Quora, to find other people with like-minded interests, to build things together, um, to find, you know, interesting kinds of niche information that you couldn't have even imagined. Like, now, but that is a lot of what young people are doing online. And the thing that is so much more engaging than like reading an encyclopedia or textbook is you're doing it with other people who share that interest. And so there's this fuel, which is that social engagement, that sense of belonging that happens in communities of interest. And that's where um, young people are really um, not only uh, hanging out, but learning together online in these specialized communities. And that's the kind of research that a lot of my studies have focused on are these communities that you know, kids are doing amazing things like translating, you know, anime or um, Korean dramas uh, over the internet to share with other fans and they're learning new languages and understanding how to do digital media production. And the potential there is there for so much um, kind of authentic interest driven learning. Um, and I've always wanted parents and educators to recognize that and support that a little bit more. That's for young great. Uh, are there some examples um, of sort of places where young children hang. I mean, I guess there's some, to some degree, I guess, you know, people are sharing sort of videos and dance moves on TikTok, yeah. right? But is there, is there like a, like, you know, like the fan subbing communities you're talking about yeah. and so on. Uh, and it's related to that, um, it's actually an interesting question that I just saw from, from Chris and he asked about sort of, can schools have schools pooled resources now that it's all video learning mm -hmm. uh, and sort of uh, twin school resources. So can, you know, resources in America be twinned uh, with the resources in Hong Kong and share. 
um, you know, because because now it's all done over video. Have you seen those type of things um, increase, or is it still well? It's still I early? think that what I feel like, at least in the U.S. context, schools are struggling so much that they haven't really gotten to the point in doing that kind of innovation. Um, there are, however, platforms where teachers can teach online. This is where my organization, too, Connected Camps, we use the OutSchool platform, which was sort of designed for homeschooling, but a lot of organizations can put, you know, you can just um, put your own offerings online and offer it. Now, that is more, more direct to consumer, though, and not necessarily school-based. Um, definitely, sort of, um, in the U.S., there are sort of charter networks that have pooled resources to share digital um, resources. It's, I think it's been, I haven't seen it as much in major sort of mainstream schooling with the COVID shift, mm. just because I think it's um, been really, really difficult for schools to adapt. And often they're just struggling with the basics, like providing um, meals to their kids and pencils and, you know, so crisis just mode. making sure that kids so don't left, still yeah, in, kids don't get still left in crisis behind. management. Yeah. Um, is there yeah. then a concern around you know the digital divide actually broadening? Um, and oh, sort of absolutely. Because of, because yeah, of just... and I think that's one of the big challenges with um, you know the gaming and digital world being considered not part of public schooling, which I'm hoping that the COVID crisis will change people's perceptions of the importance of digital and online and the social and emotional dimensions of digital, not just like putting textbooks on the internet as being part of the public school agenda that it should be um, because uh, not just for crisis management, but because it's actually a valuable platform that um, keeps kids connected even when they're not in the four walls of the school. So I'm hoping it builds awareness of this because I think right now, because it is really up to the private resources and initiatives of individual families, it is a huge digital divide because it's only the families who have the resources to have good digital connections and devices, a broadband device just for their child who have the digital initiative to go online and look for things. Those are the only families that are really taking advantage of these things because it's not part of the public agenda. There are a lot of great platforms. You were asking about, you know, what are the good places for kids? Yes. Uh, you know, the Scratch online community, which was developed at the MIT Media Lab, has millions of kids connecting, coding, creating together. Uh, Roblox is another, you know, really popular platform. I think they have about 15 million kids to create games and code together. Uh, Minecraft is obviously a huge community platform, which, you know, it varies tremendously because you can do anything with Minecraft, but there are definitely, you know, really valuable server communities. It's being used in schools a lot. Um, those are some of the platforms that I really advocate for um, educators and parents to take a look at. Now, I wish that there was a more concerted effort to building not just the commercial platforms, but those connections to public schools, to teachers, the public infrastructure. But right now, unfortunately, there's a big gap between, I mean, Scratch is an exception because it was created by a nonprofit and they do a lot of work in schools. A lot of platforms like Minecraft as a commercial product doesn't really have an incentive to, you know, tailor or um, work as closely with the public infrastructure. And then public schools don't provide a lot of support for teachers and um, administrators to bring those platforms into their um, offerings. So I'm hoping COVID might change some of that. that that's, a, that's a great point. Um, you know, and when you think about Minecraft, obviously the launch of Minecraft EDU was supposed to sort mm -hmm. of be that bridge and invariably somehow ended up being very much the right. much poorer cousin. <laughs> and, and the other thing that's interesting there is that the, the, the kids, um, you know, they might be forced to play Minecraft EDU at school, mm -hmm. but when they go home, <laughs> they're not going to touch it yeah. because it has all these restrictions. Yeah. You can't do this stuff. It needs permissions. So they'll go to all of these myriad of sort of free Minecraft servers online with their, with their friends and, and hang out with their friends. And so that brings them sort of you know, um, games, I guess, um, as, a, as, a, as an important platform, I love this because not just because we're in this industry, but also because that's what our children do. It's like people play sports 
uh, it's a form of game and we consider that to be part of schooling. Basketball is part of schooling, soccer is part of schooling. So why isn't esports or, or games well, part I of think, schooling? Uh, yeah. But the oh, thing, I, I think that's a very good analog because I think a lot of times, like we saw this with Minecraft EDU, when people think games and learning, they think, oh, we have to do math or you know, we have to do something in the core curriculum. But there's actually a genre for interest driven learning that schools have adopted for a very long time, which are clubs and athletics, um, theater, these sort of extracurricular activities that are still connected, celebrated by schools, teachers support it, the school celebrates the accomplishments of kids, and we can do that for digital engagements too. So one of the projects at Learning Lab um, that we've been doing research and development around is around how to bring esports into schools. And we've been part of the launch of a high school esports network that isn't just about competitive play, but that's tied into you know, a school club that a lot of kids can, can participate in and a school curriculum where kids get you know, technical skills and so on around esports management and advertising and economics. And um, so I think, you know, just like parents will spend time with the kids' soccer games and you know, with the coaches and so on. I think there are ways that schools can embrace these sort of interest-driven activities that young people have around digital stuff too. Well, it sounds like the kind of school that uh, my kids would love to go to. <laughs> <laughs> they can sort of integrate esports. And I think the relevancy is there. They can see the context of something that they do every day themselves and then apply sort of uh, topic-based learning in terms of as a or, you know, you learn about math and you learn about sort of, you know, I don't know, logistics or, or planning or project management uh, in, 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 a, in a game environment. But that brings the question of, is it the, you know, games are designed to make money, right? That's, that's the difference here right? in some ways. Is there a conflict, as you had to, sort of raised earlier, Minecraft wasn't originally designed to do that, yet it's still being used for education. Um, so does it mean that when a game is actually sanctioned for, let's say, educational use, does it have to go, should it go through a sort of program that is validated by government or vast first, um, or is it just free for all? Yeah, I mean, I think what we're missing within the digital games world is the kind of intermediary organizations that help make, um, it's not so much that we can't use commercial products, right? Just like you know, with traditional athletics, there's so many businesses and there's a huge sports industry and a lot of people are making money off apparel and other things. So it's not, there's always been a commercial component to these things. So that's not different. I think what's lacking is the kind of community-based organizations that mediate. So like in the US, there's a little league system that parents participate in and that the parks and recreation system help mediate just to make sure that the space is safe, it's good for kids, that it's connected to the community. And that's part of the reason why within a lot of gaming communities, um, they're not friendly to kids or they get toxic because they're, it's not um, guided by the values that parents and communities care about for their kids. And so I think it's more sort of the lack of kind of shared values, culture, institutions that are in the public interest, building communities. Um, that really make gaming culture friendly for families where parents don't have to worry. Sort of like, you know, you go to the park and your kid's playing baseball and you can probably drop them off for a couple hours if they're, you know, 12 and not worry about it and they're with a coach in the neighborhood. The gaming world, it's, it is a bit more of a free-for-all. So it's really up to parents to design safe spaces. So, you know, our organization, we saw that and what we do is we train high school and college kids, um, do background checks, uh, train them to work with younger kids, just like you know the basketball coach might do. And we create sort of safe Minecraft servers and spaces within digital spaces that isn't just about sending your 10 year old into the wilds of the internet by themselves. Most parents aren't super comfortable with that. But if you knew that there was an organization like a parks and rec or after school that you could trust your kids, that's where kids start learning the positive digital habits. So they become good big brothers and big sisters too. What's happening right now is parents aren't involved, communities aren't involved. And so it's up to the kids to you know, figure things out on their own. And there isn't positive mentorship that is about um, 
making these environments really good um, and make sure they don't get toxic. Uh, that's a, I love this point. I mean, basically, I guess what we need is a, a kind of little league esports. Um, exactly. And, uh, do you yeah. do you imagine that this little league esports would be based on different game genre types, or would it basically just be uh, sort of based? And who would be the sponsors of this? Would it be the actual game developer, or should it be community driven? I think it. I think it needs to be future? community driven, or you know, just like say in athletics, there are um, organizations that maintain sort of the standards, the rules, the you know that the leagues, right? That um, athletics participates youth athletics always has sort of a, some of them are for profit some are nonprofit. but there's sort of organizations that kind of um, own the community values and rules for a sport i think a similar thing can happen with digital games um, the high school league that uh, we've been part of was launched by a philanthropist uh, the samueli foundation and they launched a um, North American Scholastic Esports League. There had been other high school leagues, but this one was much more about connections to school and community and scholastic achievement. Um, and then, you know, it, they've scaled to hundreds of schools now. So it's possible. And, you know, there eventually will probably figure out kind of a community supported version. But in that case, a philanthropist catalyzed um, the initial growth of the network. And then gaming companies, um, you know, we, they have various agreements about using the games and sponsorship and so on, which, you know, is common with athletics as well. Great. So um, I have, uh, there's a few questions here. Um, maybe mm -hmm. we can go over. Um, one of them is around uh, the concern around whether sort of too much social media may, may actually weaken people's communication skills uh, in real conversations. Um, and, and while there may be replacement ways in which you can communicate, like how, how do you foresee that in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think that that has been a common concern that somehow kids' reliance on digital technologies will um, sort of weaken their in-person communication. Um, the research evidence isn't really there that that has happened. I think a lot of what that concern comes from is that when kids have phones in their hand, they have the ability to disconnect from encounters that they don't want to be engaged in. So it can create a lot of tension within local um, conversations and homes. And um, I think that is a real factor because you suddenly kids have been given a choice in terms of who they want to engage with that can be really um, aggravating to people who want their <laughs> attention on other things. Um, so I think that is a real thing. Um, you know, again, it's um, when we did our research with young people, we found that the biggest, bigger factor for kids not having more face-to-face -face relationships with their peers was actually the fact that uh, um, adults have gotten so much more concerned about their mobility and physical space that they don't have the ability just to wander around the neighborhood like they used to. So that's actually the thing that is limiting their ability to get together with their friends. And when, they're, when we ask them, they say, oh, we would rather get together in real life, but we're not allowed to go out. And then the gaming world or social media becomes the one way that they can stay in touch. And then when parents take that away because they're mad at them, it's sort of doubly handicapping them socially because they've cut off all avenues of social connection. So I think the underlying concern is real that kids need to be socially connected with each other. And real life is something that young people enjoy too. I think we have to look at the broader context that's driving young people to digital, which is there, especially among elite families, the kids are so overscheduled, their lives are controlled, they're not allowed to go outside. And so digital is like their last lifeline to social support. And then their parents take it away from them because they think they're on their phone so much. So it's so. Um, especially in Hong Kong, I suppose there's a popular term out there, uh, I guess, uh, helicopter parenting, I guess as some mm -hmm. people call it. And I guess um, uh, it certainly resonates when you say that it, helicopter parenting is maybe perhaps the true limiter uh, and not technology itself. Technology is a tool, it depends how it's used. And, and definitely, you know, the way that uh, children communicate today online uh, as, a, as an outlet because they are overscheduled, because they have their swimming classes or their tutor camps or whatever it is. Um, they, it's hard for them to yeah, bridge these connections. The kids need Certainly, time to just hang out, like in an unstructured way with each other. It's developmentally incredibly important. 
um, they, they need to just be able to socialize with peers. That is where the development occurs. So, you know, this, these concerns about kids not having those social competencies, I think it arises probably more for, from them not being able to have unstructured time with their friends than, um, you know, and digital, I would agree that digital is a poor substitute for, you know, kids really being able to hang out in person as well. Do you think that is true for all children or um, do you think that there's a subset of children that have a preference to being online and that's just being amplified? Yeah, I mean, I think that there has been some really interesting studies around neurodiverse children and how some, for some kids environments like online and Minecraft, um, especially like there is an equity component that it kind of levels the playing field for certain kinds of social interaction. So I would definitely agree with that. Um, I, I just think that for a lot of kids, and I think we found this in COVID, that um, online is um, an augment, you know, it's a way of augmenting. It has strengths that are really unique to online, like the ability to stay constantly in touch, you know, the fact that the relationships aren't as brittle, like they're not, you don't have to have like the four walls of a school to get to see friends if you have an online classroom. So there are definitely strengths with online and you can find people in much more specialized areas of interest than you would in your classroom, for example. So those are the real strengths. Now, the limitations are also real, I think, for a lot of kids. And so we always talk about online and real as sort of, you know, the things that matter cut across. And it's not really about one replacing the other. Each has its strengths. Great, so there was a um, question um, a little bit again on, on digital divide, uh, but I think the, the question here was, um, you know, if the US is even finding it difficult to sort of uh, go digital in this age of COVID, imagine what other countries would be facing. Um, yeah. and, and does going digital go against the efforts to, to sort of broaden education for all? Uh, you know, how would people afford it? Um, I mean, obviously this is more like a macro government with that question, but you know, if you had some thoughts, I think that would be great. Yeah, no, I think the digital divide issues are really, really real. Um, I think that, I think in terms of the equity issue, the thing that I'm hoping COVID will make people realize is that the home context really matters for learning. Um, so like the digital divide is just one small piece of the inequity in the schooling system. And what COVID did was made educators realize that how different kids home contexts are right the difference between the kid who could just you know get their broadband video connection and start doing zoom classes and the kid who you know doesn't have a computer or phone much less broadband and is struggling to eat because they're not getting lunch at school like that just became so much more visible with covid um, in in a way i hope that what the crisis does is make people realize that public education doesn't stop at the walls of the school. Like that, I feel, is the most important lesson. And digital might be a solution, like just ensuring that every kid like finally has broadband and a digital device at home because all of the kids who didn't have that were suffering invisibly before COVID. Even before COVID, if you didn't have the ability to have a computer to be able to check your homework from home, you were suffering. There were kids who would like camp out at the steps of the library with their, you know, phone to try to get their homework assignment done because they don't have broadband at home and schools were starting to use digital to assign homework. So those divides were there even before COVID. COVID just made it more visible. I think the answer is not to not do digital, but to make sure everybody as a basic level of infrastructure and that it is the responsibility of the public schooling system to ensure that that infrastructure is shared, if that's what it means to be a full citizen in a digital, digital mm -hmm. era. Mm -hmm. So maybe um, I'm mindful of the fact that we only have a few more minutes mm -hmm. um, uh, before the session ends, but there's one more question and then um, one more thing to close off. Um, the, there's a sort of a question on the future of work. And I suppose when parents think about education, you know, where they will work in the future is a big, is a big question mark. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, on, on this one, like um, there was a question here from Chris around sort of, uh, around uh, well, Jack Ma said that half of the kids will be out of work unless they have sort of skill-based learning or sort of the questions around 
how do you triangulate classroom virtual lives and all sorts of stuff to sort of maximize this, you know, in the world of, of AI and robotics. Um, and, and sort of with digital learning um, and with the fact that everything is online, um, where everything is through a computer, uh, what advantages in, um, uh, could we have as, as humans to compete in this future world? Yeah. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, the more creative focused, what should we look at, looking at and so on, like, yeah, we'd love your insights. Yeah, I mean, I think the scary thing about this crisis is that it's really accelerated sort of the gap between those who are really part of the digital economy and those who have been relying on, um, you know, more, I don't want to say traditional trades, but, you know, trades that are vulnerable to digitizing, Seeing all of these sort of mom and pop shops, like the restaurants going under, like all of this is just heartbreaking, right? Um, and so I think, you know, I feel like, you know, as somebody who's been doing online learning, obviously, you know, I have very mixed feelings because our sector has benefited tremendously from this trend, right? And all of the young people who have, you know, are very fluent and facile in digital world, you know, our sector, we're like, you know, we hired a hundred college kids this summer to, you know, teach online, like kids who have these skills are thriving. Um, and, you know, a lot of the kids that we've hired for our programs, you know, what do they know? They know how to play games and they know Minecraft. And those are the skills that are getting them jobs in this current economy compared to young people who maybe thought they were going into safe trades, like even elite kids like aerospace or something like these industries that are being um, decimated right now um, in a world that is probably never going to go back to the same like get on a plane every time you want to like meet with some colleagues like I don't think we're going back to that world of like having so many um like the, the ecosystem for restaurants and certain kinds of things I I don't know that it's going to be the same and all of these sort of big digital networks and platforms emerge from this crisis um much stronger than they were and I think it's just, uh, you know, it is um, reinforcing the fact that digital play and creativity, um, understanding how to socially network, social, do social networks online, all of these are even more essential things, skills. Do I think that's all good? Not necessarily. You know, I have very mixed feelings about it, but unfortunately, I think COVID has really accelerated the dominance of these sort of digital platforms and um, types yeah, of work. Um, in Hong Kong, the, the, there's been some companies now looking to hire people to um, build islands on Animal Crossing because they can only promote their business <laughs> virtually, they do yeah. it physically. Yeah, there's, uh, and then of yeah. course Roblox as well, yeah. paying, paying millions of dollars. To Anyone with these right? skills, I mean, it's just, you know, my kids are both college age and they're both computer science majors and they're doing quite well, but any of, you know, I would say half of the kids had their summer jobs canceled and, you know, it, it's, it's a really, it's a really rough time for young people entering the job market right now if you're not in a digital industry. Right. So um, I, I know there's some more questions, but uh, maybe we'll close it out with one thing. We only have like literally a minute left. Um, so again, uh, the few research, reported that something like 91% of the children play video games. Um, and <laughs> I'm just like, what, what are the other 9% doing? So <laughs> like, but anyway, 91%. Uh, but juxtaposed to that, um, almost 70% of parents rarely or never play video games with their children. Yeah. Right? And you know, that's a point you were raising in terms of the, the, the gap in generations and the awareness. What would, you know, in closing, what would parents or educators, how do they get to understand this world better? It's, it's you know, there's a there was an article in the Malaysia Star 40 years ago that had an image of Pac-Man, mm -hmm. basically um, sort of being sort of the Pied Piper and taking away all the children who were basically watching and uh, sort of playing Pac-Man because <laughs> they were addicted yeah. to it, right? Yeah. And of course, today everyone Pac-Man, no big deal. But when you start inserting yeah. like Minecraft or Roblox or Fortnite into that, then it's no laughing matter and parents start to be concerned again. Um, you know, what should, how should parents integrate themselves into the new virtual lives of, of the children? Yeah, so I think the rule of thumb that I advocate for is try to change, shift the mindset from control to connection. 
So we've been told over and over that our job as parents is to control kids' screen use, to limit screen time, to monitor. But if you shift that paradigm and say, let's be genuinely curious, let's try to connect with kids around digital interests, just like we, you know, if you have a girl that's really into ballet, but say you hate ballet, you would still try to connect with their interests because that's what they love. Um, so that's the kind of attitude that I think we have to take with video games. It's foreign. It may not be the kind of thing you like. You may think it's in poor taste, but take a step back, withhold judgment, approach it with, with curiosity and interest, just like any other interest your kid has. If you really hate it or you think it's toxic or bad, sure, redirect it. But I think. Um, initially approach it with curiosity you don't have to learn to play the game you can watch your kids play the game you can celebrate their wins and it can still be a fun thing even if you're not a gamer even if you're not into whatever fandom your kid is into um, it's worth um, you know try you know just approaching it like you would any other interest and see if you can find a point of connection well thank you very much uh, as that was a wonderful way to end it. Um, and so uh, with that, um, again, thank you so much, Izuka, uh, Mimi, uh, for a very insightful conversation on the future of our children and education in general. Thank Thanks you so, so much, much for having me.